Um, I'm going to be talking about Node.js. Um, so first of all, I'm new to this group, so I've only been to one other meeting. So I've just finished university with Brian, um, and I'm basically an entrepreneur. So I don't have a job. You know, I've been running my own business for about three years, and I've started up a new company. And that's what I'm into, software development and entrepreneurship. So this talk's basically going to be about um, JavaScript and um, Node.js. So this is, I think, a good illustration. JavaScript is this massive, like, old language with so many features, but only a fraction of it is actually good. Okay, so from what I've seen, um, from my experiences of programming, is that we all have kind of our own beliefs in coming to this group, you know, it, it's become more apparent and it's kind of hard because I've come from like an OO background and imperative and it's kind of hard because I've got to change basically everything I've learnt and think completely differently about programming. And even trying to convince others about how good function programming is is hard because people are just so set in their ways. Um, so functional programming, from my perspective, it has many advantages. It's terse, you know, it produces clear code, simple to maintain, and it really forces you to think better, think about creating better designs. And you end up typing less code, and it's much easier to test than um, OO code. But it does have um, disadvantages, mostly that um, it's actually difficult to design from the ground up compared to something like OO. We have tools such as UML, which can easily, you can um, visualize kind of how your software is going to work. You can kind of do that with functional, but it's not as intuitive. And new programmers, it's very hard to kind of, it's hard to get programmers into functional programming to get to um, use this kind of programming paradigm. And generally, functional programming is slower compared to your traditional languages. You mean like time to market as well? Um, I mean generally performance as well. Say C, C++, it's generally... Well, functional comp um, programming is known to be slower. Like, there are exceptions with kind of um, Erlang, but generally uh, functional programming is slower because you've just got so much more overheads to add in the extra abstractions. So coming to, into um, functional programming, you know, the first thing I think about is, is academics. You know, only academic type people use this bizarre programming paradigm. And it's, as I've used it more, I've discovered that that's actually not true. You know, all types of people use it. It's not just you know, the mathematic geeks and the academics. And coming from a business perspective, you know, I've never seen um, functional programming as being used in the real world. People don't use it in their real projects. And so it's kind of something that, you know, programmers just do in the spare time for fun. But um, I think there is a new trend starting where functional programming is becoming more popular in the business world, but it still has a long way to go. Okay, so learning functional programming, it, it does really make you think about code differently and how the whole development process, I'd say, is a bit different. So it does help you become a better programmer. So basically, I've always kind of hated OO, you know, I just really hate it. You know, it's not that it's bad, it's just I hate the way people use it. <laughs> um, side effects, yes, side effects are always evil. Um, I think the main benefit is you type less code usually, and that code is usually a lot more reusable. And the less code you write, the less bugs you have. But um, using pure functional programming languages such as Haskell, I don't really think that there's many other pure functional languages out there. So, but it's kind of unpractical when you're working on kind of large-scale business applications because. There's so many limitations in, like, even the programming languages themselves, our tools, our operating systems. We have to have side effect codes. Um, you can't, it just, 
it takes longer to kind of go the pure route and use functional programming, especially when you don't really know what you're doing and you don't have a team of expert functional programmers. And also in the business, you know, everyone has different beliefs on how things should run and not everyone in the team is trained how, you know, into this, like they don't even teach functional programming in universities these days. So it's kind of hard to get programmers into this paradigm. And another thing is that a lot of the examples and resources about functional programming, they're all about mathematical type problems. And there's no real good examples of real world applications of functional programming being used. And that's, that's I think, the thing I hate about it the most. I, I can't really view the source code of a, a well-known application that's used as um, functional programming. So, I still use it. Um, it means less code, less bugs. So, and I also use um, test room development. It's a lot easier to test code when you're using functional programming. So now on to Node.js. So this is kind of how most people are introduced to it. This is what's on the Wikipedia and what's on the website. So it's an invented I.O. framework for the VHR JavaScript engine. And basically, most people have no idea what that means. You know, it, it really, that's kind of, there's limited documentation online about what it actually is. So the purpose of the project is to take JavaScript beyond the browser. So that we, we create server-side applications as well as client-side applications, and we can also create console applications and distribute systems. We can use JavaScript as just a general, pers um, general purpose language. So we can get into some code right now. So this is a Hello World um, application. So to get external dependencies, we use the require global function. And I'll get back to this later. But essentially, this um, just sends out a text file when you go to the local host. And people are kind of like, what's so great about this? Because we've already got Ruby, we've got PHP, you know, we've got Python. They all do exactly the same thing, which is exactly right. But Node.js, it provides a scalable and easy way to create network-based project programs and um, distributed systems. And it's generally fast. It's designed to be fast because it's event-driven. And it is extremely good at concurrency. You can run a, a lot more requests per second than, say, a Rails application or a PHP application. And JavaScript is inherently good at um, asynchronous. It's so Node.js uses that. Everything in Node.js is asynchronous and hardly anything blocks. So it's good for web apps, especially real-time web apps where you need kind of thousands of requests per second. And it's good for network applications. So I've seen some examples of um, DNS servers and email servers. And it's great for distributed systems and just general purpose console applications. So I see it as kind of, it's entering the area of Erlang. Now I'm not saying it's a complete replacement, but what I'm interested in is distributed systems. And previously I was using Erlang for um, distributed like high reliability, parallel, you know, that can distribute well. And Node.js fits kind of that area well. And in Node, everything runs in parallel except for the code. And that's kind of confusing at first, but I think it's really difficult to wrap your head around at first. So, it's all about a single thread event loop. Everything is event based, and a, a new request comes in, a new event, and then you have your event loop, um, and then it spawns on the same process to handle the function to handle that event. So we can go back to our Hello World application and see what's actually happening. And whenever a user goes to localhost port 8000, so you'll be creating up an uh, operating system event. And then whenever the user requests that, the crashy call is anonymous function with the request and the response. And that gets called on the same thread. See, we've traditionally we say Apache, a new thread is created for each request, and eventually that logs on um, that kind of 
it screws up the system, it uses up so many resources and so this is more concurrent because you have um, just, it's a single thread application running, you know, running only when needed. So when there's no events to execute, when no one's using the system, it's just going to be idling, running your event loop. So traditionally, we have I.O. where we read the file, we wait, and then we call it with something. So this is kind of the old method that Node.js goes against because during this stage, you know, we're doing nothing. We've got to wait for the OS to send us back the data. Now, Node.js, it goes, we use events. So we send, we send an event to the operating system and then we continue on to this straight away. And then once that's done, then it's just gonna be idle until the operating system comes back and it creates a new event in Node.js, and then we call this function, and then we can continue the event loop. And so we're still on the same thread, but what, what this doesn't actually get called until after this gets called. So that's kind of the event-based system um, that Node.js uses. So the, the key thing to remember is that there is only one thread. So that's good because in JavaScript, that's all what we're basically used to. And being single-threaded, it means that we can use simpler code. We don't have to worry about locking, and we don't have to worry about you know, updating data structures. So we can access the data structure, at, and it won't you know, be invalidated. But the problem is that you can't get any parallelism. So to, in order to scale it, the best method is to use processors, similar to how Erlang uses them. And you can use processors to scale across distributed systems and also on multi-core systems. So processors are much safer than threads, and we don't have to worry about any state because it's just a single thread application. And usually, when you're use, making a distributed system, you use a load balancer and you put that in front of your system. So there are a few examples such as um, Hat Proxy and Nginx and Multinode is a new one which I haven't actually tried out yet. So this is good because it means that when we only have one thread, it means we have simpler designs. We have efficient application because of the event-based model and it's extremely high currency and it ends up being a lot faster for the end users. Like you saw a benchmark in the other presentation and Node.js was way up because you can actually handle a high load of concurrent um, requests because of the event-based model. So back to JavaScript. So it's basically a great language when used properly. It's a terrible language when not used right. Um, so it's a dynamic weekly type multi-paradigm scripting language. It's prototype based, it's functional, and it's imperative. So uh, people compare it to kind of C, C++, but it's really not. It's more closer to Lisp, but it's got C syntax. So the problem with JavaScript is it's a very old language, and you know, it's been through a number of revisions, and there people just thrown on to, you know, feature on top of feature and it's got bogged down with lots of design errors and even the implementation errors. We have um, different, different implementations for, say, Internet Explorer and Firefox and Safari. They all work in slightly different ways which complicate the language and there's pretty much, um, most of the books for JavaScript are bad. Um, I think Douglas Crockford the author of this one, um, he's only kind of recommended half a dozen good books, and the rest are pretty, like, Douglas Crawford, if you don't know, he's kind of the, the renowned expert in JavaScript. So there's not really many, there's lots of resources for JavaScript, but there's not many good resources. And another problem, the same problem that we have with kind of like PHP and even C++, is that there's a lot of amateur programmers who use the programming language and they create lots of bad code. So the majority of the open source software for JavaScript is just terrible code. So 
people think it's object orientated, but it's not. No, but you can kind of force it. It's prototype based, so it's similar to kind of um, I/O if you use that. So it has objects, but it doesn't have classes. You can extend prototypes, but you can't kind of inherit from other classes. So there are ways to hack object oriented programming, but in the end, it's it's just a hack. So you just it's prototype based, and I think you've got to kind of understand the prototype based. Um, prairie paradigm in order to use the object system. Now, functional, it, that gets a little bit more confusing. So, it, it supports all the concepts of functional programming, but it's definitely no Haskell, it's not pure. But I'd say it's definitely more functional than object oriented. So, I'm stealing this um, code from Brian's blog. So, <laughs> This is basically bad JavaScript. I've seen it many, many times. So we have external code, um, external variables, and then we use a function to modify it, and we end up with state. So now util ports, that's a function from Node.js. So basically that just outputs a random number. So we can use closures to kind of make it better, because what happens here is then um, this gets put into the global scope, so we end up with global variables, which are bad things. So this kind of hides everything, and it just so this external um, variable won't be accessible outside of that closure, and is still functionally exactly the same. Now, this is basically as good as you can kind of get in terms of um, functional programming, where everything is wrapped in the closure and we have our function and there's no external state but math.random um, it calls for the system time and it does do a bit of blocking so it's not purely side effect free but it's as close as you can basically get and anonymous functions you can actually call the function within kind of another function so we can kind of use this syntax now this can actually be placed outside but you can depends on your style, where you put them. So, we, of course, this could actually be put in line, which is demonstrating that you can use functions and execute multiple lines of code. And then you just need to return the results. So, JavaScript does work very well as a functional language. If you treat all the variables as constants, and you think of everything as immutable. So, if you kind of get out of the, the mindset of relying on side effects and you don't kind of have side effects in code and you can instead of returning new objects um, you just um, instead of modifying objects you just return them instead so again I'm stealing all this of Brian's blog um, can, it can be used as a non-pure functional language but what usually ends up happening is you kind of you make use of the multi-paradigm nature and you use multiple you use the multiple paradigms that JavaScript supports. So there are a few JavaScript functional libraries. So there's Node.js, which is kind of that's the library that I use. Now there's um, Woo.js for um, lazy functional programming. I don't have much experience with that. And Node Utils is the system that I've created. So underscore it has all your basic um, functional methods and so we have examples here loop through loop through each um, item in the array so again we're using anonymous functions, inline functions we can map, reduce so there, there's nothing particularly amazing but it adds a lot of um, functions that you take advantage of in normal functional programming language, we actually have to import an external library. Now, I've seen many code like this. Um, people come to Node.js and they think, you know, this, everything's a function, so that they just stick everything all together, one after the other, and they run the code sequentially. So this basically, it reads three files, file one, file two, file th three, and then it downloads the Google homepage, and it, Concatenate the results and it creates the MD5 of the Google homepage and it outputs it. So basically, this is what we have it's procedural and it's ugly. 
So, and this is kind of the traditional method that most people use for JavaScript. Now, the better alternative is to use one of the functions that I've created, um, where we run each function in parallel. So, they all run in parallel, but well, the events it gets run sequentially, but the the operating system um, events they get run in parallel. So our code runs sequentially, but the actual system itself runs in parallel. So what we have here, if you can kind of see it, I don't think you can, but a read file function, which basically it talks to the operating system and then it waits and then it signals, you know, the library when it's done, and then so we run these three, these four functions sequentially, and then when we're done, we then just concatenate the results. So we end up with a, a parallelized um, output. So we can see that we've pulled our three functions, and then we're getting the results. So this, these can be returned in any order. It doesn't have, it's not guaranteed to be sequential like that, but we, we're determined, that's determined by the operating system, so it's unlikely because um, reading a file doesn't exactly take very long. So, I'm not sure you'll be able to see that, but the observer pattern, that's from um, object orientated, so I've used that in a functional way. So, um, here we go. So essentially we've got that, the same functions from, pre from what we had before, and then whenever we have the results, we fire an event, and this is using Node.js event meter behind the scenes. So we're using event-based programming rather than kind of state-based as we're using here. And then we kind of we wait until all the events are ready and then we execute. So that's that these are two styles of um, how we can manage asynchronous function calls in Node.js. So we get the same result again. Now, copy scripts, that's kind of the, the new hyped up thing in the JavaScript land. So it attempts to expose the good parts of JavaScript, but essentially it's just a compiler which has one-to-one, -one, you know, it converts line by line from coffee script, which is a new language, to JavaScript. So it makes JavaScript a lot simpler, but it's not exactly amazing. So we, this is the example before we written in CoffeeScript, so you can get the basic syntax. So we have our functions, you know, so that's, that's how we define a function, and then that returns a function. And we use these fat arrows to kind of bind the function to the this, and this is, the, the at sign is this, so then when we're ready, when we have the result, we just call that, we call the this object, which then notifies this. So it, it works exactly the same except it's a lot cleaner than that. So we get the same output. Okay, so I'll show you some examples. This is the code anyway. So this is a basic example. Um, we're using the, the Express Node.js library. So this is written in CoffeeScript. So we start our server, we get the options from the command line, and then we set up the server, we set up an, an event, for the home page, and then we just send the world from our server number. Um, um, should be working, it's not. So I'll just try this again.
Okay, so this is running um, a low balance on the front, so if you refresh it a few times, which it won't be doing. So what I'll do is I'll load up. should come online soon. It's not cooperating. So you just have to trust my word that this actually works. So what's actually supposed to be happening is that we have three instances of um, Node.js up and running. And it's supposed to be running on different um, cores on the CPU and then yeah, working. So we're supposed to be having some sort of um, Parallelism here is not working, so we'll go on to the next example. Okay, um, comment. Okay, so this is using um, web sockets, so I should be able to communicate between the two processes or not. Yes, it's working. Okay, so we can load up the code for this, as you can see on the screen. Okay, so we start, we load our config file. We, so we're calling the operating system, we're waiting for it to return the file, so it's non-blocking. So essentially the only blocking operations in Node, in, in this script at least, are the require. So because all the JavaScript has to be run and executed sequentially, everything else can kind of be non-blocking. So we start our server, we, we configure it. So this is using the socket um, IO library. So it's used, it's a new protocol um, alternative to HTTP. So it's basically listening for messages sent by the client and then it's sending the message. So we can, we can look at the client source. So again, this is written in CoffeeScript. So we can actually see what the CoffeeScript is being compiled down to into. So this is being converted to this. So you can kind of you can see the similarities but there's more information on the um, home page. So we open up a new socket so we're kind of combining object oriented with functional here. We connect the socket and then depending on what page we're on, if we're on the same page then we initialize the event for the submits. So again, we're using the same kind of event-based pattern in both the client and the server. And I think that's another benefit of Node.js is where we kind of we can use the same code in both the client and the server. So then, whenever we get an event to submit the form, we send it to the server, and then we reset the reset the um, text box. And then on our receive page, we listen for any messages sent from the server and we add them to the page. So, as we can see here, so it's extremely simple. So, there's other libraries, not particularly interesting. 
but there, re there is still some state here because we're having to set um, variables and using um, OO to kind of initialize how to handle the, the page rendering. So here we register the view. So that the name, that will be either send or receive. So we're using a dictionary to determine the HTML. So that's in here. So it's going to return either one. And then that's going to infer it from that. So this is kind of just a brief introduction. So these are some good resources. So um, Douglas Crockford, the world's most misunderstood programming language. Um, the little JavaScriptor, that's um, based on the little schema and the little Lisper, quite a good read. And JavaScript as a functional language, that's Brian's blog. Higher order JavaScript, um, and I think that, that's an IBM resource, which is quite good. now. Ryan Dahl is the creator of Node.js, so he's kind of the, the go-to guy if you want to find out more about Node.js. And there's the, a benchmark here if you want to see some comparisons with other systems. And CoffeeScript, there's kind of no documentation about CoffeeScript at the moment. So you've got the site and that's just about it. Um, so functional programming. So I've, I did a bit of research about functional programming, how it's used in business, and it's kind of gaining popularity, but it's still not catching on. So if you want to find out more about that, you can read that. So are there any questions? No? So these are my contact details if you want to contact me. Um, nothing else?